everybody. We're so glad that you guys are here. Uh, the weather is changing and we are stoked about it. <clears throat> I have a, a few quick housekeeping things for our high noon programming. Uh, today we're joined by Dr. Emily Arndt, which I always love her presentations. I'm really excited to, to hear what she has to share with us today. Uh, we only have one high noon left on our schedule. So we will have a high noon, November 17th. Uh, it's called The Sincerity of Sham Medicine, 1870 through 1950. So all of those really horrible medicines that people sincerely felt, like felt that they did any good, we're gonna talk about those in November. It's gonna be great. Uh, the Western Heritage Center also has two brand new exhibits. In fact, one of them is so new, I just took down the exhibit construction sign this morning. Uh, hurrah for the cowboy. Uh, here on the east end of the building explores lithographs from uh, roughly eight, the 1870s through about 1900. And then the exhibit downstairs is a revisit of vo Vietnam voices. Uh, the Western Heritage Center hosted an incredibly popular gallery exhibit in 2019. And we were able to secure grant funding through the Montana History Foundation to convert that into a traveling exhibit. So the traveling exhibit just opened downstairs. It will be up here at this site through the end of the year, and then it will be available to travel throughout the region. Um, today, with our high noon, uh, I am going to ask everybody to just check your cell phones. And while you have it out, go ahead and mark your calendar for the 17th. And shortly after the 17th, uh, we are hosting our, we are bringing back and hosting our holiday play at Palooza for families on December 3rd. So if you have, uh, have children, know of young children, we've got crafts and games and music and Santa. Um, so Santa will be here and he will even read us a story. And uh, I'm excited about my face painting. Uh, so that will be December 3rd. Uh, the season is winding down, and so we are going out with a bag and really being intentional to schedule the best programs in October, November, and December. Uh, which brings me to Dr. Arndt. So uh, Dr. Emily Arndt is a professor of history at Montana State University here in Billings, uh, and has visited with us several times. Her area of research includes uh, political culture in early America, food history, and the history of women, gender, and sexuality in the United States. Uh, today, she's sharing with us about uh, women's issues in local and national politics, uh, specifically new perspectives on the events surrounding the women's conferences in 1977, when the first federally funded national meeting on women's issues was held in Houston, Texas. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Arnold. Thank you. <laughs> Grab my stuff. You know, I always feel like it's really a dangerous thing to give a historian a platform and a microphone um, because I, good luck getting me out of here, especially when it's something I am as excited about and coordinated, clearly, excited about as this material. Um, so I just want to say thank you to the Western Heritage Center for having me. Um, also a quick thank you to the Montana Historical Society that provided me with a Bradley Fellowship, um, some funding to spend time in Helena over the summer break doing research in their wonderful collections. Um, and, uh, and also thank you to you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to come down here on a beautiful sunny one of the last probably really warm days that we are going to have for a while. I'm also a little out of practice using a microphone, so please let me know if you're having trouble hearing me. Uh, I already know I'm a little awkward with it, so you don't need to let me know that. I've already got that up here. I'll try, try my best here. So, okay, without further ado, I wanted to start by providing a little bit of background on the National Women's Conference, because as I've been researching this, I've been a little bit surprised to see how much this event has fallen out of popular memory. Um, even, even folks that I've talked to that were 
you know, uh, very involved in, in political events at the time, um, that were socially aware, that followed the news. They, they seem to have forgotten about, about this event and the um, incredible hullabaloo that surrounded it in the 1970s. So just a little bit of context here on what we're talking about. In 1975, the United Nations declared the year to be International Women's Year and encouraged countries around the globe to engage in serious examination about the problems facing women both within their own nation states but also globally. It resulted in a conference convening in Mexico City in 1975 uh, and as a result of this, there was a global plan of action put into place and a lot of mobilization in the United States to take a more close look at issues affecting women in the United States. Um, so President Ford issued an executive order creating the National Commission on the Observance of International Women's Year. Um, and in 1975, uh, two uh, congressional representatives, Bella Abzug and Patsy Mink, pictured here, um, issued or, excuse me, introduced Public Law 94-167 uh, that ultimately passed and allocated $5 million uh, for states to organize women within their own states and, and territories are also included here, uh, to have pre-conferences exploring a diversity of women's issues within their own states to develop planks that they could bring with them to a national conference that would be held in Houston, Texas in 1977. Um, it's also worth noting that the National Commission issued a report in 1976 where it outlined um, the results of a long-running study that it had done uh, and offered some recommendations about things that the state commissions ought to explore with their own constituents. It's also probably worth spending a moment thinking about women's position in the state of Montana in 1977. Uh, there'd been a lot of interesting developments in women's issues politically across the 1970s in the state. Many of you know this has been a big topic uh, with the 50th commemoration of the 1972 conventional conven or constitutional convention, uh, that women were an important part of this political process. Uh, 19 of the 100 delegates elected to the 1972 con Constitutional Convention were women. Um, and they worked alongside their colleagues to pass the most inclusive scheme of equal rights of any known constitution to date with the inclusion of Article 2, Section 4 on individual dignity, which reads, the dignity of the human being is inviolable. No person shall be denied the equal protection of the laws. Neither the state nor any person, firm, corporation, or institution shall discriminate against any person in the exercise of his civil or political rights on account of race, color, sex, culture, social origin or condition, or political or religious ideas. Right? So the inclusion of sex and gender as a protected class in the state constitution was really revolutionary at this moment in time. This is also a moment when the nation is talking about the Equal Rights Amendment, which many of you know as uh, a constitutional amendment that was first proposed um, in the 1920s uh, that had finally been authorized by Congress was sent out to the states for ratification. And so in um, 1974, after some hot debate, some back and forth, uh, Montana became the 32nd state to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, which simply says, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. And this is important background information, so keep this in mind. The 1970s in the state were also a period where women were really coming into their own politically on the state stage. Uh, growing female representation in the 1970s in the state legislature is particularly noteworthy. Um, from very few women in the state legislature in the 1950s and 60s to nine women, in 1973 and 14 women in 75 and 77. Um, it also sparked the creation of a Montana Women's Political Caucus, an organization of those women legislators uh, who worked to reform Montana's laws and to erase sex discrimination. 
Dorothy Bradley, uh, pictured here, said the need for more women in the legislative process is a serious one because the number of issues which lie in the realm of women. The issues are dealt with by the legislature at a time when it is only outdated tradition that has made men the decision makers. If women are dissatisfied, they must simply show more faces for the final vote. And I think this is really expressive of the kind of mobilization um, that's spurring women to get involved in not just civic organizing, but political organizing across the decade. And as the result of greater female representation in the state legislature, there's a number of victories for women's issues, um, including the addition of a clause regarding irreconcilable difference as a reason for divorce, uh, acts to prevent sexual discrimination in the workplace, creation of laws preventing the firing of a woman for becoming pregnant, for instance. There's also more inclusive language in the laws, uh, which would you know, have the, the outcome of doing things like allowing women to be named the legal head of households. Uh, and there's also some legislative reforms that prohibit institutions from denying women credit. So a lot of movement towards greater social and economic equity for women as the result of all of this. Now, I should also point out that not all the women legislators in the state in the 1970s are part of this kind of progressive, liberal, reform-minded um, you know, cohort. Uh, there's some, including Betty Babcock, who, um, whose husband had been governor in the 1960s. Uh, she herself was, was a, a member of the Constitutional Convention and then became a legislator in the mid-70s. Um, you know, there, there's some like her that really are going to push more conservative agendas, and there's certainly pushback against the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment, and some really fascinating and very wild swings in the legislature on issues like abortion at this time. Um, but you know, o overall, the outcome here is greater attention to women's issues and the creation of bureaucratic entities to address those things within the state. So this is, this is sort of the context in which um, the International Women's Year is arising. And so Montana's commission um, is going to, to be created and begin meeting in December of 1976 in order to plan the state conference. Mary Munger, who is perhaps best known as the longtime director of the Montana Nurses Association, uh, was appointed chair men of the Montana International Women's Year Coordinating Committee, uh, which is a total mouthful, so I will probably just be saying the, the Montana Coordinating Committee. Um, they received $25,000 from the National Commission to plan the state conference uh, to try to develop a structure that's going to work for the state um, and to, to create the kinds of regions that will allow for constituents all across the state to feel like their voices are being heard. Um, so the Montana regions, there's six of them that they establish, have a, a set of objectives, and they're going to have their own regional conferences um, in order to inform Montanans about the International Women's Year and related activities, to assess the current status of Montana women, to identify common concerns among Montana women and to make recommendations to the state meeting. There's going to be a concerted effort made by the state uh, to publicize the proceedings of the regional conferences and to raise awareness about what potential issues are facing women in the state to try to drum up support and greater participation at those regional conferences. Um, so one of the most interesting things that happens is Rosemary Zion, uh, an attorney, was commissioned by the Center for Women Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. in coordination with the National International Women's Year Committee. Um, to publish a booklet on the status of homemakers in the state. Uh, this is linked to, to a variety of things, and, and this um, booklet's going to consider both the real progress which Montana women have made through the new legislation in recent years, and equally the real economic considerations which still threaten the security of too many women. Uh, those are Zion's words. Uh, by March, newspapers are going to begin publishing advertisements 
for the regional conferences. And there really is a very strong emphasis on economic concerns, on educational opportunities, um, those kinds, kinds of issues, right? So this is not women's liberation that we're talking about that's being proposed here. These are uh, not radical proposals that are being put forth to be discussed at the regional conferences. Although it is worth pointing out um, that informal networks of women that are passing word of the regional conferences along do tend to align along slightly more liberal, left-leaning politics. So groups like the American Association of University Women, um, the League of Women Voters, women's resource centers across the states, they're going to mobilize uh, to try to advertise these things. Um, we're also going to see that locally flyers are posted, posters are created. Um, there's, there's really a strong concerted effort actually by the state organizing committee to reach out to a broad diversity of Montana women um, because they really do want representation across de different demographic lines within the state. And actually this is one of the requirements of the national conference itself that when um, the state conventions elect delegates to represent their states, that they roughly reflect the diversity in terms of, of, of race, ethnicity, religion, um, you know, class structures, all of those kinds of things. They really want a very inclusive delegation to be representing states at the national convention. The regional conferences, by all accounts, were, were total successes. Um, there was a great mixture of camaraderie and entertainment and business. So these, these first two images here are both from Miles City um, and demonstrate, uh, according to the, the captions of the photos, a little bit of fun and a lot of business. So they would do things like hold um, belly dancing workshops to try to build this sense of, of community amongst the participants. Um, but then the workshops really got down to the business at hand. And so this picture from Miles City is a workshop of women discussing issues related to banking and credit for women in the state. Um, there's also going to be talks delivered on topics like women's status globally, uh, the history of women in Montana. Um, in Great Falls, Rosemary Zion actually delivers a very well-received lecture based on her publication on the status of homemakers in Montana. Um, other conferences bring in really wonderful keynote speakers. There's a, a British documentary filmmaker that did a, a very well-received documentary on the United Nations that came. Um, but again, you know, the focus is really on things like, like questions of education, women in agriculture, the status of homemakers, the status of widows in the state, uh, all of those kinds of things. Um, there's also, again, this, this really strong outreach to different demographic communities within the state to try to garner participation. Um, and there is a lot, of, a lot of concern to the inclusion of, of working class women. Many of the regional conferences offer free um, housing, for instance, or free childcare. Uh, again, to try to really craft an inclusive environment. Oh, since we're in Billings, I thought it was worthwhile to talk about the Billings Regional Conference, which was held here um, on the campus of Rocky, uh, and was probably about the most well attended of any of the regional conferences in the state. Uh, very much like the other regional conferences, it hosted a variety of workshops that allowed participants to discuss and debate the issues at hand, and to develop resolutions about actionable items that they would then forward to the state committee for discussion at the state conference. The keynote speaker here in Billings was Belle Weinstein, um, who the Gazette called no modern liber. I love this phrase. Um, but she was a, a really long running advocate for women's rights in the state. Um, she had served as an aide to Jeanette Rankin in 1917 when Rankin became the first woman to serve in the United United States House of Representatives. Uh, she was an ardent suffragist and a proponent of the Equal Rights Amendment. The Billing Gazette describes her as she's getting ready to deliver her keynote, dressed in a red knit suit with gold ribbon in her hair and a gold scarf around her neck. 
She talked about her long battle for women's rights and why it's important for women to have a seat at the table. She said it isn't that women see any more clearly than men, but that they're more impatient to get things done once they see what is wrong. Now, while she was promoting the Equal Rights Amendment in her keynote address, she elaborated on some of the growing criticisms that the National Women's Conference was beginning to incite from conservatives, both in the state and nationwide. She said, I'm hearing the same arguments now as I heard in 1914 from the people who opposed suffrage. All the talk about the family going to the dogs and the home falling apart. Women's voting rights didn't destroy the family. Equal rights for women won't either. Um, and I'll just say, I really, I love this image. Um, I don't know what they're doing here, but I want to be hanging out with them. So Belle is pictured uh, with Fran Elge. Here's a prominent attorney and judge in the state and also a longtime advocate for the Equal Rights Amendment. Now, it's this issue of the Equal Rights Amendment coalescing with a couple of other developments at the national scale that are really going to shift public tone regarding these proceedings. Um, so in late March of 1977, President Jimmy Carter reconstituted the National Commission on the Observance of International Women's Year and named Bella Abzug its chairperson. And I don't know if anybody here knows that much about Bella Abzug besides John, who knows quite a lot and sort of cued me into some of this. Uh, she, is, she is one of the most divisive political figures on the national stage at this time. Um, and she is going to incite a firestorm about the direction that she takes the national IWI. So James Kilpatrick, who's a nationally syndicated columnist, um, writes a, a really powerful editorial about what he calls Bella's $5 million boondoggle. He claims to see an ulterior purpose behind the International Women's Year. He says this is not just about assessing the status of women and barriers to participation in public life. Instead, he says, this is a quote, this commission will be spending our money in a desperate last ditch lobbying effort for the pending Equal Rights Amendment. He charged the commission with political partisanship, extreme liberalism, and most damning, an illegal diversion of public funds to promote the ratification of a constitutional amendment. Now, although the editor of the Great Falls Tribune, where this was published in the state, um, challenged some of those, those uh, those things that Kilpatrick said, um, this is going to really create a new discourse about the state's participation in the National Women's Convention. Um, in fact, by early June, the state had formed a chapter of the Citizens Review Committee for IWI, which will release um, a press release that charges the Montana State Committee with misusing federal funds to support the Equal Rights Amendment and abortion on demand. Led by Joan Zormier, who's pictured here, uh, she was a homemaker from Lewistown, also sidebar, she was the state director of Eagle Forum, a conservative political action group. She was also the director of the state's chapter of the Right to Life Association and the state chairman of the Montana chapter to stop the Equal Rights Amendment. All right, so she is going to take over this committee in the state um, and really create the conditions that lead to the growing politicization of um, the women's conference within the state. And the, you know, the state committee is really going to try to deflect attention away from controversial issues like the Equal Rights Amendment and abortion and say, no, 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 we really want to talk about credit and economics and education. Um, but Zormir is going to echo Kilpatrick's claim that the committee is biased and corrupt. Um, and really challenge the use of taxpayer dollars to finance pro-ERA positions. And as evidence for this, anybody want to guess what do they see as the most damning piece of evidence that the state committee has an agenda? 
the keynote address delivered in Billings by Bell Weinstein. Right, without any opposing points of view being offered, they're going to say this is federal funds being used to promote partisan positions, and this is grossly immoral and illegal. Um, so she is going to further push these issues to not just include the promotion of the Equal Rights Amendment, um, but she's also going to look at the IWI's national report for endorsing the Supreme Court's recent decision on Roe versus Wade regarding abortion. In an editorial in Helena's Independent Record, she says, this is truly shocking. Federal funds, our own hard-earned tax dollars, are being used to promote the killing of unborn children. Now, all of this is happening, uh, but the Montana International Women's Year Committee is going to, again, continue to highlight all of the positive things, uh, promote inclusivity. Um, they are going to continue preparations for the state convention, developing workshops on women's health care, employment, education. Yes, there is one that they're developing on the Equal Rights Amendment, but they say that's not the focus, that's not the central purpose. Um, and that if you're really interested in debating these issues, then come to the conference. This is sort of the refrain over and over that you hear in the papers. They say the state meeting is open to all Montanans who want to share their ideas about the many issues concerning women. The only viewpoints that end up excluded will be the viewpoints of those Montanans who choose to exclude themselves by not attending the meeting. Uh, now, despite attempts of the Central Committee to reach out to various demographic groups, um, there is also, aside from this kind of conservative backlash, uh, growing concerns from working class women, rural women, Native American women who feel grossly unrepresented by the state's Central Committee, which they see as middle class, liberal, and very white. So a group of Native American women planned a caucus to be held the day before the state conference began in Helena. Uh, Myrna Smallsalmon, pictured here, was the caucus coordinator, and she noted that Indian women in Montana are unique because we realize that our problems cannot be fused into resolutions that will be drawn up by our non-Indian peers. Now, the Indian Women's Caucus also worked with the Montana Migrant Council to try to recruit Mexican-American women, as well as reaching out to black women across the state, um, again, to ensure that minority and working class women were adequately represented at the state conference. So despite the attempts of the state committee to reassure people that this is not a foregone conclusion, that all voices are welcome, that this is not a concerted effort by women's libbers to sneak the ERA in uninvited. Um, that's where public conversation on the issue continues to go. And, um, you know, internally, the state committee is really, really worried about this. I actually found some, some fascinating internal communications where they are listing all of the people that they know have been contacted by Joan Zormir. Um, they are circulating the propaganda, which is often coming into the state from national organizations um, like Phyllis Schlafly's Eagle Forum that's being amplified in public discourse more locally. Um, and so, you know, these groups, uh, the Eagle Forum, the John Birch Society, uh, they're really going to create a, a rhetoric around the Equal Rights Amendment that's very, very powerfully motivating to many women in states like Montana, particularly states that have large populations of Mormon women, of Catholic women, of evangelical women, who fear that this push for equal rights is really a push for ending traditional gender roles, for breaking down the family unit as they understand it. 
Um, and so increasingly, the propaganda against the International Women's Year in the state um, is, is going to focus on you know, what exactly is wrong with the ERA, that it would for force women to register for the draft, that it would force women to use unisex bathrooms, um, but also increasingly that this is part of a broader liberal campaign to force things like abortion and homosexuality on the constituents of states like Montana. Um, there was an audio cassette that was recorded by an Oklahoma woman named Diane Edmondson uh, that began to circulate within the state of Montana. I don't know how many, but I'm assuming dozens of copies of this cassette recording were made and sent all around, um, particularly through groups like the Eagle Forum and the John Birch Society, uh, as well as women's auxiliaries to, um, to the, the Catholic Church and the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints. Um, and, and in this recording, this woman talks about how the International Women's Year is really evil personified. I mean, this is the language that's being used increasingly, that this is a battle of good against evil, that women's libbers and the ERA would force women to leave their husbands, that they would destroy the nuclear family, that communal child rearing would be the only option available, uh, that also, I mean, things start to get really, really radical in this tape. They accuse the International Women's Year of mandating the teaching of abortion and masturbation and homosexuality in schools. The woman on the tape says, if the IWI conferences go as they have planned, there will be no stopping them. But you see, it doesn't have to turn out that way. The IWI can be stopped. But if it is to be stopped, then you will be the ones who have to do it. Most interestingly is at the end of all of these recordings, Joan Zermier, our Montanan um, anti-IWI activist, pops in and gives all of the listeners all of the details that they need to know about how to prepare for the state conference, who to talk to, where to go, where to find more information. Um, and so, you know, she says, let's show them by our numbers how strongly we support God and country. Right? This is so widely circulated alongside the kind of propaganda from Eagle Forum that you really start to see it popping up in editorials and letters to the editors in newspapers across the state like this one, uh, which talks about you know, a greater danger slithering in uh, if the ERA becomes part of our constitution. That is the right of homosexuals. Since they cannot reproduce, they must recruit to carry on their nefarious activities. I mean, this is, this is literally verbatim a quote from this audio cassette uh, that's being replicated in a Montana editorial here. All right, so women across the state are going to begin to mobilize in mass through their political action groups um, and especially through church groups to plan on attending the state conference. And they're not planning to just show up. They are planning to show up with their homework done. Anti-ERA activist Vicki Stoll talked about how um, she organized women church groups in her communities to engage in a two-day crash course on Robert's Rules of Order. Others, like Marilyn Fernelius, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, said that she was informed about the state meeting and then met with friends to prepare myself on simple parliamentary procedure and to study the IWI national recommendations and to form a more poor, perfect union in order to formulate a plan for what workshops she wanted to attend and what recommendations she'd like to see proposed. She also noted that all of this material was circulated through the Women's Relief Society, that is the Women's Auxiliary of the Mormon Church um, across the state, along with the church's official statements on issues like homosexuality, abortion, and the Equal Rights Amendment. So, just make sure we're doing okay on time here. All right, at the state meeting itself, um, despite all of these concerns about anti-IWY mobilization, the organizing committee was super excited and ready when participants began to descend on Carroll College's campus on Friday, July 8th. 
Uh, the governor had issued a proclamation declaring it Montana Women's Action Week. Uh, and as the day proceeded, women were really just coming in from all over the state. There was a palpable excitement in the air, and everybody got prepared to attend the opening business session following a glowing opening address by Lieutenant Governor Ted Schwinden. Now, as the business meeting unfolded on Friday afternoon, it quickly became very, very clear that this was not going to be a procedurally simple approval of the rules, as was moved by Vice Chair Mary Hempelman. Sherry Olson, president of the Stevensville LDS Relief Society, instead asked that state rules be read and voted upon individually. This was approved by the majority of participants at the business meeting, and so they started literally one by one by one by one going through the rules. And I'm not going to bore you with all of the changes that they made, but let's just say the outcome was to minimize the control of the state coordinating committee over the proceedings at the conference, to eliminate the bias towards the prepared slate of delegates that the state coordinating committee was going to recommend, to allow nominations from the floor for the delegates that would represent the state, and to allow nominations for leading of the workshops. In essence, they voted out the workshop chairs that had been preparing assiduously for weeks and weeks leading up to the event, and voted in their own leaders for all of those things. So it, it, became, it became really, um, really clear very, very quickly that those who opposed IWY were in fact the majority in the room, that they had done their homework and that they were prepared to move the conference in a direction much more to their liking through uh, procedural changes. Linda Jackson of Helena called upon the chair for a point of personal privilege, expressing the growing dissatisfaction of women in the room who felt like their meeting was being taken over by those hostile to its intent. Jackson invited all those people who seem to be in the minority, all those individuals who are very dissatisfied with what's happening so far, to leave and meet out in the ballroom right now. Now, they were warned by uh, the parliamentary expert that if they left, the meeting would continue and business would be conducted in their absence. Some chose to leave at that moment. Further debates over additional rules continued, and an unidentified participant proposed an alternative, more democratic IWI meeting be held in a separate location. Another unidentified participant read a petition that had hastily been circulating in the meeting space, challenging, and I quote here, the steamrolling tactics being used by two or three heavily organized, heavily financed groups, but representing a minority of women in Montana. A meeting that had been set to take 90 minutes dragged on for more than six hours, and before it was finished, hundreds of women representing the minority position walked out in protest. These grim-faced women, as captioned in this uh, image from the Helena Independent Record, assembled in a Helena Park the following day where they held their own business meeting, they held their own workshops, they wanted to elect their own slate of delegates, um, although they were warned that their proceedings would not count, that any platforms uh, voted upon would not be official, that any delegates elected would not be recognized by the National Committee, um, they were so distraught by the proceedings that very few chose to return to the state um, convention on Rocky's campus. So uh, on Sunday at the closing meeting, uh, the delegates who had been elected by the majority coalition was announced. Um, you can see here, these are, uh, I think about 12 of the 14. Um, and I'll just point out, I'll point out some of these folks for you here. Uh, so this is Betty Babcock, right? The, the long time um, politician in the state. Um, we have here Suzanne Morris, who actually is a really interesting case. She is very much 
um, part of what I would call the sort of libertarian wing of the conservative coalition. Uh, and her arguments are very much about overreach of the federal government, um, intrusion of the federal government. She says, actually, in this little quote in, in this um, this publication here. She's like, I'm not afraid of the draft. I'm not afraid of having to use the same potty as a man. She's like, I'm afraid of the government getting involved in my life. Um, so uh, uh, many of these women, though, are um, much more religiously conservative. Marilyn Daigle here is one of the, the Mormon representatives who's elected. Um, Ann Allen, very strong Catholic voice in the community. Um, so. Of the 14 delegates that the state is allowed to send, all 14 are elected as part of this conservative coalition. Um, now, the, the women who had been in the minority at the convention are going to feel really affronted by this. Um, they are going to charge men with usurping their power. Many of the Mormon women had come in large vans, they'd come on buses, right? They'd mobilized with their congregations, and if you're driving across the state, it makes sense you're gonna carpool. Uh, but their opponents challenged them for bringing men with them, men who apparently had walkie-talkies and were coordinating and telling which women to go into which workshops and when, and apparently directing them how to vote. Uh, the women who walked out of the meeting feel that they had been cheated, that this had been a, a, a fascist takeover. They use this language. They either call it a fascist takeover or a communist takeover, um, depending on who is writing the angry editorial. Uh, and, and you know, I think, I think the interesting thing here is that they feel that things unfolded unfairly rather than recognizing that there had been a political mobilization of women leading to an outcome that was not what they expected. Um, you know, these women that formed this conservative coalition, uh, they'd used community meetings, they had done their homework, they had read the platforms, they had studied Robert's Rules of Order, for goodness sakes, which is just like the biggest snooze I could personally imagine. Um, and they turned out the vote, right? Much more so than the more liberate coalition they turned out the vote. They had the bodies in the room. They got the platforms they wanted. They got the delegates they wanted. Now, the fight didn't stop there. Um, the angry minority opposition posted editorials. I mean, my very unofficial search in four or five Montana newspapers yielded no fewer than 40 letters to the editor in the two weeks following the state meeting, uh, at least another 70 in the weeks leading up to the national conference, right? And that's just in like four or five newspapers in the state. Um, they also, you know, begin to launch some legal challenges, uh, challenging the authenticity of the proceedings. They work with um, May Nan Ellingson, a state legislator, to issue a minority report to send to the state committee. Um, they send letters to senators, they lobby the national committee, uh, they begin petitioning campaigns in their local communities to try to demonstrate that the women who are elected do not represent the will of the women of the state. Now those delegates really use their platform as an opportunity to discuss the issues that are important to them. And so this anti-ERA, uh, momentum is going to continue after the state election. In fact, eight of the 14 delegates attended a Stop ERA conference held in St. Louis by Phyllis Schlafly, uh, and the only reason the other six didn't go is because they were too busy taking care of their kiddos at home. Um, they make plans to lobby the state legislature to rescind the state's ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment in the upcoming legislative session. They use editorials to blast the liberal, um, you know, positions of the National International Women's Year. Um, they meet at, uh, at events locally. So this was actually, this picture here is a, an AAUW meeting that was held here in Billings, where they invited the delegates to come and speak. And um, essentially, uh, the woman, particularly on the, the right here, Leona Dietz, 
spends the entire time lambasting um, the evil empire and talking about the return of Satan onto, onto Earth um, and, uh, you know, essentially what's going to happen if the International Women's Year unfolds as planned. Um, and actually, the, the, <laughs> the reporter who covered the event said that the women of AAU dub uh, kind of sat there in stunned silence as these two were talking. And then when it came time for, for questions, there were two questions that were really more politely phrased statements of difference. And then they, they set about their business meeting as quickly as possible to try to force these two to leave. Um, so, you know, there's definitely a continuation and actually a ramping up of a lot of the rhetoric that had emerged before the state convention. Um, and, you know, most interestingly and ironically, opposition to the IWI itself from the delegates of the state to the national convention. Uh, they begin to do their own petitioning campaigns um, to develop a platform that they can send to a pro-family, pro-life rally that's going to be held at the same exact time as the National Women's Conference. They collect 15,000 signatures across the state, um, voting on resolutions in support of a constitutional human life amendment in opposition to federally controlled preschools opposition to the ERA and opposition to the promotion of homosexuality or prostitution. So, um, clearly, they have an agenda. They're using their positions to get it. Now, the National Committee recognizes that in some states, there is incredible imbalance in the delegation, and so they go ahead and appoint two at-large delegates for the state. Uh, Mary Munger, who had been presiding over the state committee, was appointed, as was Myrna Small Salmon, the woman who had organized the Indian Women's Caucus. At Houston, Montana is going to be called out as exemplative of the kind of divisiveness that emerged in regards to the IWI, a New York Times article touting the kaleidoscope of American women interestingly includes not one Montana woman, um, Myrna Small Salmon, but two, Joan Zormir, who are kind of pitted against each other as examples of how this debate had degraded. Um, and so while many women showed up in Houston, 20,000 actually, to attend the National Women's Conference, an almost equal number showed up to attend the quote pro-family rally that was being hosted on the other side of the town. The state delegation, um, unsurprisingly, uh, voted mostly as a united front. The 14 elected delegates um, voted against the Equal Rights Amendment. They voted against federal funding for preschools. They voted against women's health care planks. Um, the uh, at-large delegates voted in support of almost the full list of planks that was promoted there. Um, overall, at the National Women's Conference, it was something like an 80-20 split, with 80% of the attendees having been elected by the states representing moderate to liberal women's interests, and 20% representing this kind of conservative coalition like Montana's delegation. And of course, the great irony here is that um, the, the women of the Montana delegation who were now in the minority felt that they had been railroaded, uh, that, that the, the conference had been taken over by fascists and by communists, and that they had not had a chance to have their voice democratically heard. So. You know, what's the, the sort of conclusion from all of this? What's our takeaway? Well, this is sort of where I'm still ruminating on things here. Um, I think on the one hand, uh, although Montana's participation in the National Women's Conference was, was obviously acrimonious, uh, was routinely depicted by the media as a pointless fiasco, it also refocused politics for the next few years around women's issues um, and continued to allow women in the state legislature 
to keep bringing these things back into conversations. I would say conversely, it ushered in an era of Republican dominance in both the House and the Senate. Uh, the year following IWI was an election year, and it's the first time that both the House and the Senate flip Republican in many, many years. Um, and so I think, I think it highlighted the politicization of issues that are going to be really important for a Republican partisan insurgents in the state. Uh, but conversely, the women who are members of the state's legislature are going to predominantly stay in the Democratic camp and continue to exert a lot of power in the state legislature. And uh, you know, the attempt to rescind the state's ratification of the ERA in the 79 legislature fails in large part because of a more moderate and liberal mobilization sort of swinging the pendulum back against the conservative mobilization that had taken place in 77. So I think I've talked enough, um, and so I'm going to, to take a breath and um, allow any questions that you might have. Thank you all for your time and attention. Yes. Yeah, there's a handful of states that have the same thing happen, and it's states um, that have a, a conservative-leaning population to begin with. It's states that have um, large populations of particular religious denominations, uh, and it's states whose conferences were later in the process. Um, I think that, that the Eagle Forum and John Birch Society they really start to go after particular states as targets for this kind of you know, takeover. I don't like the word takeover because I, I, don't, I don't think they took it over. I think they just surprised the hell out of everybody. Um, but yes, uh, and so probably, probably the best study is um, Aaron Kempker has a book, Big Sister, Feminism, Conservative, and some in Conspiracy in the Heartland, uh, where she talks about the state of Indiana, which also, like the KKK is involved there. Um, there's lots of interesting things that are happening, but Indiana, um, Utah, and surprisingly, there's a couple others. Nobody? Okay, well, I'm not gonna stand here awkwardly, uh, any more awkwardly than I am with my awkward microphone, but I'll, I'll just simply say thank you um, to you all for coming out this afternoon, and uh, I really appreciate it.